Well, thank you everyone for joining us for today's virtual IMS user group uh, session. I am excited to have Steve Nathan here with us today. Uh, we're going to have a great talk. Uh, if you're new here, we typically start our meeting with a pretty simple agenda, um, an introduction and welcome. Hi, my name is Amanda Henley. Glad to have you here. I'm based uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, where it is uh, pretty overcast and rainy today, but we had a nice clear day yesterday for the eclipse, which was fun. Um, we are going to have a couple of introductory uh, things, then our presentation. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. I've got a couple news and articles for you uh, to check out, and then uh, we'll talk about what's next. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And again, all along the way, if you have questions or comments, you can put them into the meeting chat. And um, I know a question that we typically get is, is the presentation going to be available? Are the recording going to be available? The answer is yes across the board. And if you are not already signed up for our newsletter, I encourage you to get the newsletter if you want to drop me a message in chat to sign you up, I can do that. Otherwise, you can sign up at virtualusergroups.com. The newsletter is going to give you the announcements for the next sessions. It's going to give you the recap articles uh, and any other resources that are available. So let's get going. Um, before we move too much further, I want to thank our sponsor for this uh, series, BMC. Um, obviously, they have a great uh, a lot of great resources and tools, so please check them out. Tell them I sent you. And then, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then after today's session, we have an exit survey. It's going to come quick when you start to close out, but I would appreciate you um, doing our exit survey. It's two questions, um, one about the session and one about future sessions. So just uh, take a moment for us there, please. And um, now we're ready to get started. So pretty easy, painless uh, intro. I'm going to stop my share that, so that Steve can start his as I introduce him. So you should be able to go ahead and take over, Steve. Mm -hmm. And um, while he's doing that, I'll let you know that he has 38 years of experience as an IMS developer, application analyst, DBA, Systems Program and Performance Tuner, and has worked for IBM in IMS Level 2 support since 20, uh, 2003. So um, welcome. Thanks for being here. And I'm excited for the session. Take it away. Well, hello, everybody. Hope you can all hear me. Hello to all my IMS friends out there. Uh, this is going to be my yelling session, you know, is um, in IMS Level 2 and IMS support. Um, we're trying to resolve the problems as quickly as possible, and hopefully this session will help us do that. We have our standard disclaimer. Okay, here's an agenda. Um, there's a lot of things you can set up before we ever get a problem. While the problem is happening is a very key part of it. After the problem, what you can do to resolve it and then as a, as a last resort, you can come to IBM. And then I have a appendix on the IMS Connect recorder trace. And we do know that IMS is perfect. Um, we do once in a while have an ab end or something like that. Most of the problems that you encounter and that you give to us are things just aren't working right, performance, things like that. So we'll talk about that also. Okay. First of all, I want to thank Jeff Maddox, who since retired from IBM, but he did several sessions called Making It Difficult for IMS Problems to Hide, and I've certainly taken a lot of bullets from him. And also Kevin Stewart, um, a wonderful IMS expert, and he explained timeout and lock time and deadlock, which we're going to talk about later. This is what I said before. So before the problem occurs, there's a lot of things you can set up in your ZOS and IMS and TCP IP environment. The first thing you're going to need 
and you, you could take this back to management to, if necessary to show them, you're going to need some tools. You need a, an IMS monitor, whether it's main view from BMC or Megamon for IMS or Tmon, you should have one of those tools. You should have a tool to analyze CPU. Uh, Strobe now belongs to BMC and IBM has the application performance analyzer, but you should have one of those two. You want to analyze logs and traces, not just IMS, but um, DB2 and whatever. So BMC has the AMI log analyzer for IMS and IBM has two products, the IMS performance analyzer and the IMS problem investigator. And you should have one of that set. You must have one of that set. If you're using IMS Connect, you must have either the BMC Energizer or IMS Connect extensions. So you can take this to your management if necessary. There are a couple of tools that I'm gonna be referencing here. Um, I have a link to the documentation. The first one is DFS ERA 10, if you're not familiar with that. It's an IBM tool, it comes with IMS. Um, and it lets you go to your log record and select and format log records. You can select them with a, a string or based on bit settings or data in fields. Okay. Um, you can print the log. You can also use it to copy selected records. I use this for extracting certain records from a log and creating a mini log. And it can be used on any file, not just an IMS log. I've used this to browse uh, image copies and try and find things. Okay, And the selection works on it too. The selection is just offset and value. So it does. you can do this with any file, not just an IMS log. It can be very useful. There's a start after and a stop after parameter. So you can just look at part of a file. You don't have to process the whole thing. The only little trick is if you don't say stop F equals EOF and you have more than 16 million records, it's going to stop because that's the default. So always code stop F equals EOF whenever you're using DFS ERA 10. Okay. There is an exit routine called DFS ERA 70. You look at the documentation. And what I've listed here, you can select records based on a lot of different values, all the records for a PST or region ID, uh, all the records for a PSB or a DVD. Um, if you're looking at a database, you can look at an RBA or a block. There's more values here, all the records for a user ID. You can see all these values in here. It's a very, very handy tool. The other program to look at that IBM provides is DDLT0, the DLI test program, and there's a link to the documentation there. You can run it as BMP or batch, and it makes DV and DC calls from system control cards. You can code SSAs, you can code AIBs, you can repeat calls, you can compare results, and you can print the data only when the output is useful. Uh, for example, only, only print out the data if there's a G status code or something like that. Okay. You can dump DL1 control blocks. Um, you can punch selected control statements to create a new tests. You can merge tests. And one other thing which is very handy, you can do WTOs and WTORs. So you can start one DLT0 issue a WTR to hold it, start another DLT0 and have it run while the first one is waiting, and then reply the WTR and have the second one take off again. So this is really good for testing uh, conflicts between programs. 
And as you're going to see later on, it's also good for analyzing uh, database calls if there's a problem. Okay, some of the ZOS things that your ZOS system programmer should set up to make it easier to find problems. Number one is make sure the system trace table is large enough to capture events. When we get an SVC dump, there is the system trace table, which I'll show you an example of. And it's a table that ZOS keeps in core. The default size is only one meg per CPU, and we really recommend three meg per CPU. And with today's large computers, that is not a problem. So the way to set this up is in the COMMND uh, PARM line member, you just have to put this command trace ST comma 3M, and that'll get the system trace table to have enough entries that we can try and find data. Okay. Now, if you want to look at a SysTrace, and I recommend that you do that, just to play with it, if nothing else, go to, into an SVC dump and you enter the command IP SysTrace. You can say time local, and you can look at it. Now, there's a lot of stuff in it. So I've given you two links for documents that will help you decipher all the things in a SysTrace. And just for the fun of it, I have an example here of a system trace table. And you can see SVCs, you can see IOs, you can see dispatches, there's PSWs in there, so you can see who's calling it. Somebody did a get main, okay, somebody did an EXCP. You can get down to really very, very fine details using the SysTrace. So I recommend playing with it. The next thing that we have to make large enough is something called the master trace table. This keeps part of the current NVS syslog in core. So when we get an SVC dump, okay, we can see the latest um, job log entries and syslog entries. So the, the default is only 24K and we want to make it 1000K. So in the SCED PARM live member, you should set this parameter empty size 1000K. Another thing which is very important is something called the common storage tracker. Common storage, which is SQA and CSA, everybody can put storage in there and we're constantly analyzing CSA and SQA and we need to keep track of who is allocated what. So in your DIAGXX PARM line member, there is a parameter VSM track CSA on SQA on, make sure that is set. There's negligible performance, the table is stored in ESQA, and we use this all the time in uh, support, not just IMS, everybody. Now, if you have a SVC dump and you have looked at this storage, have you turned this parameter on, you can go in and display storage various ways. You can ask for a summary or a detail and sort it by a lot of ways, by address, by ASID, et cetera. Now, when you have a private address space and it, it admins, or it ends, ZOS cleans up the storage. But if you've allocated CSA or SQA and you haven't explicitly freed that and your program ends, now you've orphaned that common storage. So you can enter the command here. You see where the keyword is OG, meaning owner gone. And you can find all of the programs that have ended and left CSA and SQA dirty. Very important. Okay, this just shows if I did um, IP Vervex own con summary, 
The first thing you see is a grand total of how much is allocated in each one, SQA, CSA, ESQA, and CSA. <clears throat> and a whole um, line for owner gone. So you can see a lot of people have left CSA dirty here. And then when you page down, you're gonna see one line per ASID. And AC means it's active and OG means it's owner gone. And then you can see how much CSA and SQA each address space currently owns or used to own. And now if you do it and you say, I want detail, and in this case, I said by ASID and address, and I chose the um, IMS ASID, okay? It'll show you each piece of allocated storage in CSA and SQA, okay? This address here, um, it starts with a zero, zero, so this is below the bar, okay? So this is just um, CSA, and it'll show you uh, the return address of who did that, got that storage in IMS, it's usually just one place. And then it shows you, excuse me, the first few bytes of what that storage looks like. So you can see a lot of what IMS or anybody else has allocated in common storage. Speaking of common storage, there was a new parameter in uh, ZOS a few releases ago called best fit CSA yes. What happened was in a previous release of ZOS, they changed how CSA and, and SQA were allocated and they just chose the first um, chunk of storage that fit as opposed to trying to look for a good spot to put it. And that became the default. And a lot of people were fragmenting the CSA and ECSA. So they added this parameter to go back to the old way to use best fit. But for historical reasons, they didn't want to change the default. So the default is null. So please make sure that in your dyad parameter, you said VSM best fit CSA yes. Very important. Okay, these are just some of the other um, parameters you can see in the Diag uh, Parmly member. Okay, we're going to be taking SVC dumps and we have to make sure there's enough room for them. So in the command Parmly member, there is this command um, to allocate the amount of space. The default is only 500 meg. And in today's address spaces, that will not work. So we want to set that to um, 5,000 meg. Okay. Now, SVT dumps are extremely important. And you can get them two different ways. You can get them manually, or you can set a slip. And the commands to get these dumps can be prepared ahead of time. In the IEA DMC Parmine member, you can pre-set up some commands for taking manual dumps. And then in the IEA SLP Parmine member, you can set some slips, have them ready to go, and then activate them without having to type them in. And you can specify wildcards for job names. Okay, and we're going to look at some of these. Okay. Now, if you want to take a manual dump, the first thing you would go to your ZOS console and you say dump com equal, and then you can give us some comments. And it would come back with an outstanding reply. And then you have to reply all of the parameters for the SVC dump. You have to say job name equals, and you have to say S data equals. You have to type all this data in every time. Or you could put a member into the IEA DMC Parmine member, 
you can say job name with IMS and a, and a wild card, others in a wild card, pre-put in all the S data parameters. And then when you want to take the manual dump, just say dump com equals parm life equals, and it'll create the manual dump with the parameters that are in parm life. Okay. So we recommend that you take the time to set up some dumps that you know you're going to be taking. Okay, slips. We're going to ask you to set slips. So you should be able to set your own slips and know sometimes that you want them without us telling you. So you can put some of these skeleton members into the uh, Parm line member and then edit the Parm line member and then say set slip equals and it'll enable it. And I'll give you some examples. Okay. You can set up a slip on a system ab end. So here's an example. You say ID equals, maybe ID would be OC4 or, you know, um, 80A, whatever. The ID is your ID. Comp is the completion code. I'm sorry, that's the 80A or the OC1. And you can have this set up in advance. And so if you get um, a bunch of OC1, say, in, in an NPR, you can quickly edit this and set the slip and get an SPC dump for us to look at or for you to look at. You can do the same thing on a user ab end. The comp just has a U in it. Or if you're starting to get a bunch of error messages and you want to get a slip, get, get us an SPC dump, you can have set a slip on a message ID. So have this member in Parm Live edit it for the message you're interested in, and then set the slip and get an SPC dump. These are all very important. Okay, collecting the proper SMF records. We look at SMF records all the time, and this is a minimum that you should be collecting. And I, I talk to the GOS performance um, support people and they agreed to this list also. I'm sure you're all connecting SMF 30 and SMF 7X, which are your RMF records. But make sure you're also collecting SMF 79-15. These are IRLM long lock records. We're gonna talk more about them later but please make sure you have these turned on for when you start getting database locking problems. SMF 98s are new. They're called high frequency throughput statistics or workload interaction correlator. Names don't mean anything, but what this collects very detailed data and ZOS um, performance um, support can use these records to get extreme detail of what's happening inside your system. So they're new, but please turn them on. And then SMF 99 and 113 are things you should also have on all the time. Okay. Now you want to abend, you want to avoid an advent 40 dog. Okay, when storage becomes full, ZOS is going to try and create a dump, like an 878 or an 80A. But ZOS needs some storage on its own to create that dump. If the dump is successful, then the data is preserved, and then IMS cleanup will get control, and IMS will clean things up. If there is not enough storage to create the dump, you're going to get an Advan 40 dog, meaning it terminated at end of memory. You don't get the data in the SPC dump, and the IMS cleanup routines might not get control, and you may end up having to IPL your system. You may have things dirty. But you can reserve storage um, so that ZOS can take a dump in a JES exit called IEFUSI, and make sure that your system programmer has done this. 
We don't want 40 drug advents. Also, if you set these two slips um, in IA slip, then they'll catch the 808 or the 878 before the SV, before the system tries to take the dump and get the 40 drug. So we recommend that these two slips be set all the time. And you notice the keyword there is enable. So that means these will be enabled when you IPL. We want to avoid 322 and 522 ABNs, like in, especially in NPRs, okay? Because when you get these, IMS may not clean up resources. Now, Jess has an exit called IEFUTL, so that instead of giving a 322 or 522, it temporarily expands those limits and it avoids the bad ABN. Now, IMS ships in its sample exit something called DFS UTL, which is an IMS specific sample exit. And we recommend very strongly that you take this sample and implement it in your ZOS system to avoid 322s and 522s for IMS regions. The same is true for a 722 advent lines exceeded. This is fairly new that I, I, IMS has supported this. JES has the IEF USO exit. And now IMS has a new sample exit called DFS USO that we ship in our sample line. Please make, your, make sure your ZOS system programmer implements this exit also to avoid 722 advents which IMS may not clean up resources. Okay. In the um, IMS exec, in the PARM, there is a format uh, option, FMPO, make sure that is set to D. That way, IMS will produce a, a system dump um, if it has any sort of error. And if for some reason the system dump can't be taken, it will use the sysmdumpbd card as a backup. And I have a link here to the dump formatting options, but you really want to use D. We sh you should have sysmdumpbd cards in your IMS regions, control, DLI, SAS, and DBRC as a backup in case the system, the system dump doesn't work. You must specify disk equals mod, and you have to scratch it and reallocate it after each use. Now, in the IEA DMR00 PARMI member, you can specify what the S data is for the sysm dumps. And if you want to send them to a GDG, we have an example here of what you could put into your regions. Getting a dump is very important. For the dependent regions, make sure there's a SysU dump. And this IEA DMP00 PARMI member, also, you can put in some parameters, and these are the ones that we recommend. Please make sure you install the IMS dump formatter. Okay, I want you to look at IMS dumps too. The IMS dump formatter is amazing. It's got extensive options for formatting IMS and related address spaces and SPC dumps, including IMS Connect and ODBM, lots of things. So I have a link here to how to install the IMS dump formatter. And I recommend that you play with it in a sandbox system, get an SPC dump of IMS and its regions, and look at all the wonderful things in there. I'll be showing you some of them later on in the presentation. Okay. IMS has table traces. And there are some of them that we recommend that should be on at 
all times. They're internal. They're just going to trace to internal tables. Okay. The, there is very low overhead. But if these traces are on all the time and all of a sudden there was a problem, we could look at these internal traces and maybe help to analyze what the problem is. Okay. So in the DFS VSM ProcLide member, we recommend that you specify these four traces with the keyword equals on, so that they'll be on for internal tracing. Now, you can put them to external data sets by issuing this command and then saying option log. And there are other table traces we may ask you to turn on in special circumstances, but these four should always be on and internal. There are external trace data sets, DFS TRA01 and 02. You can allocate them via DD cards, or you can have DSF MBA dynamic allocation members. Please make sure that you have these set up. If they do not exist, and then you turn on a trace and say option log, it's going to write it to the olds. And this could affect performance. You really want these records to go to the trace data sets. Okay. Let's talk about lock time and deadlock. Okay. Lock time is an IMS parameter. It's specified in the, in the VSM proc line member for online or the VSMP for batch. Deadlock is an IRLM parameter. Now lock time, this is, here we go. Lock time in IMS corresponds to timeout in IRLM. Okay, what does this all mean? Well, thanks to Kevin Stewart, I think I can explain it. First of all, here's a link to the documentation for enabling the IRLM lock timeout feature. This is the parameter, lock time equals, and you have one for online and one for batch. And what this says is, how long should an online region or batch region be waiting for a lock before IRLM comes back and tells IMS, this guy has waited a long time for a lock. Okay, You're setting a parameter in here to pass to IRLM to tell him how long to wait for a lock before he comes back. And what you can say is, if this guy is holding the lock for too long, what do you want me to do with this address space? Do you want me to abend it? Or do you want me to give him a BD status code? And you can specify a lock time between one and 32, 7,067 seconds. How long do you want any region to wait on a lock? Okay. Now, IMS will pass a timeout parameter to IRLM when it starts up. So IRLM, you're establishing the timeout value in IRLM. If lock time is not coded, the default is 300 seconds. If lock time is coded, IMS is going to pass the smaller of the online or batch values. Okay. Now, if, it, one, if a lock in IRLM waits longer than this lock time or this timeout value, IRLM just calls our lock timeout exit. Okay. And this is where we'll check online or batch and how long it's been waiting and if we really have waited too long, okay? We can tell IRLM to reject the lock and IRLM is gonna issue this message. And we're also gonna write this SMS 7915 log record, which are gonna be invaluable for analyzing long locks. That's why we want these collected. Okay. You can change the IRLM timeout value by command, okay? But, and that's gonna help, but 
and you can change the IMS lock time parameter, but IMS passes the timeout value to IRLM only when it starts up. So if you update the lock time value via IMS command, it only changes it in IMS, but it hasn't notified IRLM of the change. So the IRLM lock time, uh, timeout value is what it is set when IMS came up or what you changed with the modify IRLM command. So if you change the IMS one, also change the IRLM one at the same time. Okay, deadlock, that's an IRLM parameter. IMS doesn't tell IRLM what it is, it's only an IRLM. Yeah. IRLM checks for a timeout during deadlock cycles. So deadlock is usually much smaller than timeout or lock time. And IRLM checks for both deadlocks and timeouts, regardless of any IMS parameter. Okay. For many systems, a deadlock time of one second is good. You don't want to wait too long. And IRLM only checks after two cycles. So even if you say deadlock one, he's only going to look for it after two seconds. And the another recommendation is that the IRLM timeout value be an integer factor of the online or batch timeout value in IMS. I know this is complicated. You can study it, and then you can send me questions, and then I'll go ask Kevin. OK. There are seven common service layer address spaces, call them the CSL address spaces. And I've listed them here. <clears throat> DVRC using VPE is optional, but um, these are the seven uh, CSL address spaces. They're built on a set of common services called BPE, which stands for Base Primitive Environment. Now, BPE provides internal tracing for itself and for the CSL address spaces. And we use these internal trace tables all the time. They're extremely useful. Now, the size of these trace tables is controlled by control cards. You have a BPE CFG ProcLive member which is read anytime any one of these address spaces starts up. Okay. And I'm highly recommending, if not yelling or screaming, that these trace level statements should be in the BPE config member for every CQS address space. The same one. If you start up a um, DBRC address space and it reads a control card for CQS, it'll just ignore it. So it's easier just to have one set of values that turns the trace on high and has 300 pages. I will tell you that it will not affect performance and that you won't run out of storage. So please have this set in all your CSL address spaces so that we can look at these traces if we need them. Very important. And when I run my report against them, I print out what the pages are and I can tell if this hasn't been set. Okay. So these are all the things that you can do before we've even gotten a problem to help minimize problems or collect the proper data when there is a problem. Now we've got a problem. Right. If it's just uh, IMS admended, uh, that's standard. Okay, we've probably taken care of that with the previous things. But most of the time, what we get is, oh, things are running slow. We're getting these error messages. So what happens when you have a problem? The first thing we highly recommend is that you have documented procedures for gathering the documentation. Okay. Make sure your operations knows what to do when there's a problem. 
have, have a written checklist and set up automation to do as many things as possible. That can be very helpful. The first thing I yell at when there's a problem is turn on the DC monitor. I say that all the time. And here's the command, you can set it on or you can set it on and say stop automatically after a certain number of seconds. I would like at least two minutes, okay? 60 seconds is okay. I'll settle for 30 seconds. The DC monitor has a lot of good data, which is not in the IMS log. The IMS log is for integrity and for recovery. It's not for performance. It's not for problem analysis. We use it, but we really need that monitor on. The next thing is, look at your online monitors. Look at your Omega Mon for IMS or for DB2 or CICS or any other online monitors that you have. It, do you see a bunch of regions waiting on locks? Okay. Look at the online monitors. And, and I'm emphasizing this in red, have your ZOS team look at RMF monitor three or whatever equivalent you have in your shop. Because it may show that IMS's regions are waiting for CPU or waiting for DASD or other resource constraints. Okay. You can see this in real time and it can be very, very helpful. Because if you don't look at them, then when you open up a case, I'm going to ask you to send me the RMF data for when the problem happened, the RMF monitor three. But if you look at it right then, you can solve the problem without having to open a case. Okay, set a slip. Don't wait for us to tell you. If you see a bunch of error messages constantly coming out, set a slip on the error message. If you see NPR is constantly abending on something, set a slip, get an SPC dump. We like SPC dumps. And you've seen how to do that. Okay. Take an SVC dump. Don't wait for us to tell you. Use the dump com command. I showed you how to do that. Okay. Get all the IMS address spaces, the control region, DL1, DBRC, IRLM, any suspect BMPs, MPRs, IFPs, and other address spaces as necessary. DB2, MQ, RRS, things like that. And they should all be all in one dump. You have a job name parameter and a, you have a job list parameter, JL equals, include all of these into the, into the one SPC dump. It's much easier for us to look at it all in one dump. Okay. If there's a problem with the OTMA interface from IMS connector NQ, these are two OTMA traces that we'd like to have on. Trace set on T member, and you give it the T member name, like I miss connector MQ member name. This is going to write 6701 log records to the IMS log. And then trace set on table OTMT, option log volume high. This is a trace table. And this is going to write them to the DFS TRA XX data sets. And also take an SVC dump of IMS, make sure it's got the control region and connector MQ so I can look at all the OTMA control blocks for what's happening at the time. This is very important. Okay, if you're having problems, the application talking to databases, getting back bad status codes, whatever, Turn on this trace, trace set on PSB. You give it a PSB name and the keyword comp. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. This is while the problem is happening. If there's a problem with the application 
um, IMSDC calls, like get you to the IOPCB or change insert purge to IOPCB or all PCBs. Things aren't working the way you want or you're getting unexpected status codes. Turn on this trace. Trace set on program and you give it the PSV name. And we'll talk a lot more about this trace later. I'm just trying to get you to do these things while the problem is happening without us telling you to do them. Okay. If there's a problem with CPU or long waits, activate strobe, activate API. Okay. If things are going on in IMS Connect, turn on the IMS Connect recorder trace. There's two of them. There's the standard one or the VPE one, okay? Um, and all the details for this are in the appendix. So all I'm telling you here is turn on the trace in the appendix. It'll tell you how and how to look at it. Okay, IMS Connect Extensions has traces. And it has what's called a collection level and a trace level. If you're trying to get detailed information, make sure the collection level is set to four. Make sure the trace level is set to two. And there are online commands to change this dynamically. And I'm sure BMC Energizer has a similar function. Okay, these can be very useful. TCP IP packet traces. If you're using IMS Connect and you're seeing messages like HWSP 1415 or 1485, and we're going to talk a lot more about this later, start a TCP IP packet trace for the port that IMS Connect is listening on. I know at least one TCP IP system programmer is listening, Perry, so turn it on. Okay, make sure your TCP IP team is ready to do this. We'll talk more about it later. LE events. If you're getting uh, Aben user 40XX, like 4038 and 4039, these are LE events, and what they're trapping is real events, such as OC1 or OC4 or OC7. And these 40 XX event dumps are usually not helpful. What we really want is real events, OC1s or OC4s. So these options, these LE options should be turned on in your applications. You want to say trap on no spy. You don't want LE to intercept these admins. And then you want to say term thread action UA dump. You want to get a dump when they happen. Or you can set a slip on the OCX admins. Now, if you have an SVC dump and you're trying to find out from the LE information, what the real application admins were and registers, I have a link here to the documentation to this APAR. It's an informational APAR. That's what the II stands for. And it'll tell you if you get one of these LE admins and you have an STC dump, how to find all the real dump information. This is very, very useful. Okay, you may want to stop an IMS region. And before you do that, please always take an SVC dump before stopping or canceling IMS. Now, there is this command, modify IMS comma dump, that gets you a user 20 admin. Please don't do that because IMS cleans up some stuff before it takes the admin and then we lose it. Okay. For IMS dependent regions, you can do stop region, whatever. That'll just stop it. Or stop region add dump to get a, a, a SysU dump. Sometimes that will hang, okay, depending on where you are with IMS. 
if you do stop region cancel, it'll get rid get rid of that. But if your region happens to be talking to IMS at the time, it can also bring down the IMS control region on a user 113 ab end. So in a test environment, maybe so try not to use stop region cancel. Okay, as a last resort, all right, take an SVC dump and then you can cancel, OS cancel IMS with a dump or use your Omega Mon kill of the equivalent, but be ready to IPL. Hopefully you never get here. Okay, now we wanna get ready for, to send us the documentation or for you to look at the documentation. Turn off all the traces. Switch the olds so that we have a fresh old and all the data we know is on the previous olds. Copy the monitor data sets. Okay. Copy the recorder trace data sets. Save all the information. Save the trace data sets. Save the RMF monitor three data. We want to know we have all this when we go to look at the problem. Okay, the problem is over and now we're trying to analyze it. But first of all, you should be trying to analyze it. I'm going to be using IMSPA and IMSPI for some of these examples because that's what I happen to use. I'm sure that the BMC um, has similar reports and could show you how to use those. Okay, it's the method that counts, not the tool. The first thing, my motto is AGF. Always Google first. Google those about all the IMS manuals. So if you get an IMS event, Go into Google and search IMS, for example, 0402, and it's going to come back and it's going to take you to the documentation in the IMS manuals for that event. Okay. Or if you get a bad message number, Google knows that. If you search on a search IMS and DFS 554A, you're going to get a link directly to the IMS manual for that message. Okay, so again, my motto, always Google first. That's what I do, even in support. We have our own tools for finding things. I like Google. Okay, Google knows about closed APARs. So suppose you see an OC4 in DFS ASK00. Go into Google, and search on a Bend OC4 DFS ASK00, it's going to come back and give you a link to this APAR. Okay, it doesn't know about open APARs, but as soon as an APAR is closed, Google knows about it. Okay, or if necessary, read the dump directly. IMS has a dedicated team to maintain the IMS documentation. They are the best in the business without a doubt. Okay. They're, I mean, every day we're updating these manuals. Okay. And here's a link to the uh, IMS documentation. Okay. We want to analyze the DC monitor data. You were very nice. You turn on the monitor. What are we going to do with it? Well, first of all, IMS provides this program, DFS UTR20, to process the data. Unfortunately, it doesn't produce anything useful. Okay. I use IMS PA, or you can use the BMC tool, to produce reports. And what I do is I produce all the reports in one execution of IMSPA, and I provided you the JCL and the control cards to do that. 
Okay, here's the JCL. And then these are the control cards. If you use these control cards, all of the reports are gonna come out to one DD name, the DD name mod reports, and then you can have everything in one place. Okay, and then you can scan through the reports, you can find a PSB, you can find a database name, everything is there for you. Okay. Very important for analysis. Okay, if you had a problem with your database calls and you turn on the program trace, okay, I'm sorry, with the DC calls, and you turn on the program trace, you can use DFS ERA 10 to extract all those records. Okay, there's 6701LA3A, which is the record written before the call, and the LA3B, which is the record written after the call. Unfortunately, it doesn't format these calls very well. Okay. I recommend that you use IMSPI to format these records. You can, you know, in IMSPI, you can filter on records. So you can go to IMSPI and say, show me all the 6701s where this CT dupe ID is LA3A or LA3B. And it'll come back with a list of all of these 6701 records and if you select any one of them, it's going to show you in detail all of the IMS control blocks, the, uh, the call function, the PCB, the status code, um, the I.O. area, all sorts of good stuff. So you can see, all right, your, your program did a change call to something you weren't expecting. Okay, if you had the PSB trace on, your program was doing database calls and you didn't understand why or how, you can use DFS ERA 10 with this exit DFS ERA 50, and that will format these trace records very nicely. Okay, here's the JCL for it. You select um, the five Fox log records. You use an exit routine of DFS ERA 50, and they're going to go to the trace punch, TRC punch DD card. And what you get is all of the control, every single deal database call that your program issued in DLT0 control card format. Okay. It did a replace to relative PCB 51. Okay. It did an insert. It gives you the data. It did a get unique. You can see the SSA there. Okay. You can, you, your programmer says, I did this. And you can show them the cards and say, no, you didn't. Okay. Very useful for analyzing database calls. Okay. One other report that is extremely useful is the IMSPA program trace report against the DC monitor. For every region, it's going to trace every DL1 call, the time, the status, the IOs. You can select by PSB or TRAN code or region against the monitor. And this is the start of what that looks like. It shows I did a get unique to the IOPCB. Um, 302 milliseconds later, I did a get unique to this database and I did one OSAM IO. Okay. Later on, I did a get unique to a database. I got a GE status code, but to do that, I got one, two, three, four, five, six VSAM IOs and one OSAM IO. Now, this doesn't have the SSAs, but you can match this up to the program trace or the programmer should know what he's doing. And, and there's more from the program trace. It's extremely useful in looking at detail on what your program is doing. Okay, deadlocks. 
Okay. You can use DFS ERA 10 to print out. Whenever there's a deadlock, IMS writes 67 Fox Fox deadlock record to the IMS log. And you could format them using DFS ERA 10 with these control cards or IMS PA with these control cards. And then you can look at this and you can figure out what these deadlocks are. The IMS manuals have a link, have a whole section in there on how to read a deadlock report. Okay. Rich Lewis wrote an um, IMS orange book on IMS locking in incredible detail. And it's still available online. And I have here a link to that. So with these two links, you should be able to analyze your own deadlocks. Of course, if you have a problem, you can open a case, but play with it first. Okay. If you're having CPU problems or weights and you've run the strobe or APA, run those reports or use the interactive panels for looking at those sample data sets. If you see something that implicates IMS, okay, sample, save that sample data set. If you were using APA, you can do what's called an extract of that APA sample file and send that to the case. And we can look at it here. If you're having strobe, you're gonna to have to send us the strobe reports. We can't look at the sample file. But nine times out of 10, the CPU is in the application anyway. Okay. If you're looking at OTMA synchronous call out, I call. Many customers are using this now. IMS writes without turning on any traces, all of these records, detailed records for every I call. It shows you the resume T pipe that the application did to get the icon messages or the cancel resume T pipe if it timed out an IMS connect. It shows you that the message was sent. It shows you that the client acted or enacted. It. it shows you that the client sent a response. And then it shows you that OTMA act or enact that response. Okay, these records can be very handy for analyzing iCalls. You could format these with um, the IMSPI. That's what I use. Okay, and here's, this shows the control cards to filter uh, in IMSPI. There's also a um, link in the IMS manual, we've documented in detail what these synchronous call-out log records mean. So there's a link to look at that. <clears throat> Analyzing a TCP IP packet trace. If you want to look at it, you can use IPCS. First of all, you're going to need an IPCS directory. And I just give you some a job here just to set that up for yourself. Everybody's going to need a directory. And then this is the job to format the IPCC, the TCP IP packet trace. Okay. This is some of the important fields that you're going to see. There's a source destination, which is an IP address and a target destination for this particular packet. And the source port and the destination port, 5,000 is probably IMS Connect. And then there are flags that say, what did this particular packet do? And these are what some of the flags are. If you see an ACK, this is a TCP IP internal ACK, not an application ACK. If you see a SYN that says, I'm starting a socket connection. A push says I'm sending data. A fin says I'm ending a socket connection. Okay. And then a reset says the, the socket was reset, which is very bad if you're trying to talk to IMS Connect. And 
these flares can be combined. You can act in, says, I'm acting um, this socket startup, or I'm acting this data internally for in TCP IP. If you're using HTTLS, the data itself will be corrupted, encrypted, but we're really interested in the flow, not necessarily the data. You can get the data elsewhere in other traces. Okay. If you see these messages, HWSP 1415E or sometimes 1485E, okay, IMS Connect is just the messenger. It did a TCP IP read or write and got back a minus one return code from TCP IP. It's not IMS Connect's fault. What it usually means is that your IMS Connect client ended the socket connection prematurely. So it should be investigated by your TCPI system programmer and the application team. And if you get stuck, you can open a case, but you can look at it yourself. The IP address, this is the IP address of the client. And then there's an error code. The most common ones are 1121, which says that the connect client reset the socket or it did a timeout. But you can Google the others, what these E return codes are. The ID is the client ID of the IMS connect client that sent the message or that we try to read from. If the ID is Dell dummy, it means that the client opened up a socket and never sent in a message. IMS Connect accepted the socket open, turned around and did a read for the initial message so we could figure out who you are and got the minus one return code immediately. And sometimes you can see hundreds and thousands of these because some misbehaving IMS Connect client is doing a, a, a connect and then immediately stopping. Okay, well, you have the TCP IP address, go yell at them. If the ID starts with HWS, that's the IMS TM resource adapter. If the ID starts with GMP, that's the IMS TM service provider for ZOS Connect. Otherwise, it's probably a roll your own IMS Connect application. But you should be able to work on these yourselves. Okay. Analyzing virtual storage. I just threw some stuff in here. It's very important in case you want to, if you're running out of storage, or if you want to increase pools or buffers. Okay. You can use the... Um, General Storage Statistics Report, which is part of the IMSPA IR report. It shows real storage and virtual storage and control region DL1 storage. Or you can use the EDA option at the IMS stuff formatter. Okay, I'll show you those. Okay. If you're using the dump formatter, there's an option called EDA. And then there's a sub option called five, which says sys. And then there's another parameter under that says stats. And it'll show you, for example, the number of CPs and how much real storage you have. It'll show you common storage right now. Okay, how much is, what the limit is, how much is currently allocated and what percentage is allocated. You can see very quickly if you're running out of common storage. It shows you the control region private storage. Okay. It shows you the DLI private storage. Okay. You can also see all of the C CSA and SQA that IMS is using because we create a CDE or an SDE for every piece of storage that we allocate. And you can use the EDA option and say CDE com 
and it's going to create a list of every piece of storage that we've allocated in CSA and SQA, and it has a name. LSCD is a control block or a module name or uh, RDS DCB. We have a DCB for the RDS data set. Okay. So you're going to see every piece of storage that we allocated. And then um, at the bottom, there's a summary of all of the storage that we've allocated in common. Now, IMS overall performance, um, you can produce many reports with one execution of IMS PA. The output should go to data sets, not to sys out. The IRUR report has the most data and browse all of these reports. Now, detail analysis of these reports, that's a topic for another day. I'm not gonna go over them, but I will show you how I collect them. Okay. I do it, all the reports in one execution of IMSPA. You have your log input, you have your output data sets, and then you have one DD name for each one of the reports. So these are going to data sets. And then in the IPI command, you put all these commands, you're producing all of these reports at once. And they're worth browsing. Okay. Okay. Well, now you've already solved like 90% of the problems yourself. And so for the 10% that you have to come to us for, here's what you have to do. First of all, if you're opening a case, make the, the, the explanation as detailed as possible, especially in the initial entry. We can start work faster and we can route it to the proper routine. Include recent changes in the environment, exact time, exact resources, this trans code, this PSB name, show the system dump if there was a, uh, an, a dump, okay? Make that initial entry as detailed as possible. Send all the documentation terst, even text files, job log, syslog, et cetera. If you don't send it terst, then we have to go through a couple of steps to get it to our ZOS system so that we can browse it. Send all these files without having us having to ask for them. The dumps, the NVS syslogs, sys1 log rec, the IMS logs. Now these logs must contain at least two IMS checkpoints. Otherwise we can't run some of our reports. All of the job logs, the trace data sets, not the reports, the data sets. Okay, send files with very descriptive names. IMS log one, IMS log two, or IMS log time, you know, 0102, time 0105. We spent a lot of time looking through log data sets, trying to get them into order and for which IMS they belong to. So make those file names very descriptive, please. Okay, that's the end of my story. Um, here's the appendix. I'm not going to go through this. This is for your information. Um, I go into great detail on collecting the IMS Connect recorder trace, and I show you exactly what's in it in case you want to interpret it yourself. Okay. And of course, I'll take questions. And uh, I'll leave it up to the moderator to do that. How do I get out of this? You're welcome to drop questions in the chat or you can come off oh, mute sure. and ask them directly. Close this. Can y'all hear me? Close this. I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, hi, Karen. Hi, Steve. I'm here. 
Hey, Steve, just saying hi. Oh, hi, Paul. <laughs> well, hi, John. Good to see you again. See, I told you these are all my friends out there. I've been with IMS for 50 years, not 38, actually. So I, I know most of you. That's awesome. <laughs> IMS is, is a, it's a, it's a family. It really is. I, I definitely recognize some names from, uh, from the IMS user group for sure. And then also from uh, the influencer program that Planet Mainframe is running. Yeah, oh, yes, John, sushi. <laughs> for those of you that go to SHARE, the IMS project goes out for sushi one night during SHARE. And I wish I could invite you all. We have a very good sushi place right here in Ithaca, New York, where I am. So if you get to Ithaca, I will take you out for sushi. <laughs> and John, you're invited. Going up to visit my son in Buffalo, Steve. I'll pick you up on that. Good idea. <laughs> How is Larry? the eclipse? Oh, unfortunately, right now it's beautiful. It's bright and sunny. Yesterday it was um, overcast. And oh, for literally one second, there was a hole in the cloud. We saw part of the eclipse and then it closed up again. <laughs> oh, dear. It got a little bit dark and that was it. <laughs> Was anyone in a good uh, pattern for it? Did anyone see it in almost totality yesterday? I, I have kind of a good news story to tell at the, especially Z, who I see on the phone. Uh, Z might appreciate. For uh, personal reasons, I happened to be in the Manhattan yesterday and uh, between three o'clock and four o'clock, no one was working in Manhattan. Everybody was out on the street. Everybody was friendly. Nobody was pushing and shoving <laughs> and arguing as is common in, uh, in Manhattan. Um, everybody was sharing Eclipse glasses as they were, you know, if somebody didn't have one. It was a... Um, I, I haven't seen that much camaraderie <laughs> in Manhattan among busy, busy people in a long, long time. Good to hear. <laughs> well, I've got just a couple of slides. Um, I, I If we... Uh, don't want to talk about any questions and we can keep talking about whatever uh, else too. But um, I did want to drop that um, again, our sponsor BMC, they have um, the uh, BMC Amy data tool that you can check out. These are QR codes that are very scannable for use. Um, we are running our most influential mainframers um, program over at Planet Mainframe. And it's just a, it's an opportunity for us to profile people that have been really influential in the space and influential to other people. It wasn't, um, it's not a, not a big competition or anything, but a chance for us to really take a look at some great folks out there. Um, I was telling Dusty earlier, I've had such a good time reading everyone's profiles and, and getting a chance to write about people through this program. So, um, those are being released every like Monday through Friday from Planet Mainframe, um, multiple profiles at a time, just because we had so many to do. Um, you, know, you say if you're talking to Dusty, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, then uh, on the job board, there is a, a, a there are a couple of opportunities, but I just threw up one opportunity where they're looking for some IMS talent in the Chicago area. And um, at Planet Mainframe, we are, of course, always looking for contributors that want to write or do podcasts or videos um, for the community. Just the same, um, I am looking for speakers for IMS. So if you've got a presentation or tips or tricks you want to share, uh, let me know. I'm just a Henley at planetmainframe.com, um, or you can find me on LinkedIn. 
and let me know. And then we're, uh, we've got really great growing social media uh, groups. I think our most popular is probably LinkedIn. Um, so you can go check us out at virtual VUG LinkedIn uh, for our virtual user group there. And I think, again, thank you, BMC. And then um, in the exit survey, again, I'll just I'll plug it. It's kind of hard to miss if you close out really fast, but it's just two questions. Um, and then one of those being, what is a future session you'd like to see? Uh, last time we met, I asked uh, y'all what you thought about a session with AI and IMS. And there's some interest there, so that's something we're pursuing too. Um, but uh, any session that you're looking for, let me know, and uh, we'll try to get one on the calendar. Did we have any remaining questions or comments from today? Um, yeah. Uh, when we will have access to the recording of this session and about the presentation itself? I, uh, it'll all be posted in about a week. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Amanda, one other comment. Um, like Steve did, uh, if you could actually put r real links instead of the things that we have to use our phones for, mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be helpful. It looked like on one view graph, you actually had real links, but the one before that was all, uh, you know, was the ones that we, and I, I find sometimes my phone works with those and other times it doesn't always. Yeah, your, uh, especially in the newsletter when we share these things, that you, what you'll get real links. Um, okay. it, it, because you can't just copy paste off my screen, unfortunately, <laughs> um, which would be actually, we should get on the phone with the Zoom folks, right? Because that'd be a pretty cool trick. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but I, these will all be in the newsletter. And if you're not signed up for the newsletter yet, uh, you can drop your email address in chat and I'll grab it or shoot me a note or just go to the website and sign up. Because every when we don't have a meeting that month, we do a newsletter that's got a recap article, links for the video and everything, um, other news announcements, links like these. So um, some good resources there. And I think overall we might send you like, uh, you know, between meetings, you might get four emails from us in the course of two months. So it's not a, it's not a big, it's not, it's not a lot of stuff, not a spam thing. So, all right. Well, great. Thanks, Larry. Um, if there's nothing else, Steve, thank you so much. My pleasure. I always yeah, like it. <laughs>